Right, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's just go ahead and read the chapter and then we'll go back and, and look at it. The, the main theme of what I want us to talk about is the several different ways that Paul identifies himself and his group in their relationship with the church at Thessalonica. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that he, he looks at their relationship and he just mashes all of those metaphors together. He's good at that. He'll, he'll be talking about uh, one description and then all of a sudden he just changes it completely and describes it in a different way. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you all the gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we made does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. You know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. We also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those people suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they also heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you. We wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. And so uh, several different ways that he introduces himself, reminds him of the relationship that they have. Uh, first of all, he says, we're those who were treated outrageously. We're a group of people who were trying to do the right thing and were beaten up because of it. You remember they uh, were beaten in Philippi and then thrown into the jail. Of course, it ended up with the Philippian jailer being converted and all of his family being baptized. But his stay in uh, Philippi was pretty bad. When they left Philippi and went to Thessalonica, things were doing pretty well at the beginning. But unfortunately, the Jewish leadership in Thessalonica finally started tearing them down, chasing them. So they get out of town. They go to Berea. The, the leadership from Thessalonica chases them and goes to Berea catches up with them and runs them out of Berea. So they really had a tremendous difficulty just in getting the message out. People were listening to them, and the church was growing, but they were constantly being outrageously treated, as Paul says, beaten and imprisoned and maligned 
by the people around them. Then he says, we are those who have been entrusted by God with this message. And I want you to notice that he doesn't say, I am the one who has been entrusted. He says, we are the ones who have been entrusted. So he takes the other people who are with him in that group and, and puts them all in the same category. And I wanted to look back at uh, Acts 17 where they first come into Thessalonica. In Philippi, there's Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke that are traveling together. It's what we call a we passage. So Luke is talking about we did this, we went there, we, we encountered this. When you get to 17, you get when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. But he doesn't say when we went. Luke says when they went, when Paul and his associates or his companions, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went in, and on three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So Paul is the main spokesperson, but Paul refers to the group as we came to you preaching the message. We were entrusted by God with this message that we brought to you. And then he actually uses a phrase that it's really kind of odd. Uh, let me make sure I've got it here. Um, uh, I left myself a Corinthians. Hang on a minute. Let me get back to Thessalonians. First Thessalonians 2. Um, Verse 4, on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We're not looking for praise from people or from anyone else. Uh, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Kind of an interesting phrase. When you think about apostles, how many apostles do you think of in the New Testament? It's 12. Okay, you start with 12, right? Mm -hmm. Judas dies, so we add Matthias. James dies, James, John's brother dies, so we add Paul. But seem, you pretty much stay with 12. Uh, I looked up several different people's opinions on this, and uh, a lot of them said there were 12 and 12 only, period. One of them even went so far as to say Paul wasn't really an apostle. I disagree with that one, of course, but they, they were on that end. The other one that I came up with I found really interesting, and he was working off of the Greek word. The, the word is apostolos, and it means one who is sent out. So when Jesus sent out the 12, they were apostles. He selected them. He sent them out, therefore they're apostles. But there are, if you add them all up, somewhere in the range of about 80 to 85 people in the New Testament that are said to have been sent out. And they use that word to describe it. Those apostoloses. Those folks that are, are sent out with this message. So I, I, I've got a list. This is from Rick Renner. Uh, the the original 12, of course, that we know of. And then in Luke chapter uh, 10, he sends out a group of 70. You remember when he takes 70 and he sends them out two by two? Uh, some translations have 72, sent them out two by two. They are referred to as those who were apostolos. They were sent out. Uh, then you've got Apollos, uh, Epaphroditus, James, the brother of the Lord, Barnabas, a fellow named Andronicus over in Romans 16, Unia, who's a companion there, uh, Titus, uh, an unnamed brother who was with Titus that Paul sent, so they were apostles, apostles together sent by Paul, uh, Timothy and Silas. So lots of folks have that designation. The difference is when we're talking about the apostles, we're talking about people who saw the risen Savior people who were called specifically by Jesus. And when we're talking about other people who have that designation kind of attached to them, that they were sent out, that that word apostolos is used to describe them, that they are 
not apostles in exactly the same sense. When we talked about elders, there's that word presbyteros, the older men. And all of the older men need to be respected just by virtue of their age and experience. But not all older men are elders. All elders are older men, but not all older men <laughs> are elders is the way that one would work. So, um, so Paul is very plural about this thing, right? We came to you. We spoke to you. We were sent to you. We were apostles to you. And we could have used our authority as apostles if we wanted to, but we didn't. So it's a, just an interesting way that Paul approaches that. So that's another way he describes who they are. Um, then yeah, he's, he wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't the first 12 could do miraculous things that the others could not do. Yes, uh, we don't. So, so I don't, you know, don't. The office of an apostle compared to the description of somebody sent out is the difference. It's just the same word oh, yeah. that's used. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Paul, Paul worked apostles. Uh, I'm sorry, Paul worked miracles as an apostle. Uh, the rest of them you don't see. We don't ever see Barnabas working a miracle, but he's referred to with that same word. He was even a companion of Paul. Timothy was a companion of Paul, uh, but we don't see any miracles necessarily from Timothy. So, uh, again, there's, there's a big difference between being one that was sent out with the message and one that was hand-picked by God to be an apostle. But like I said, the, the word is used to describe over 80 people. And Paul uses it just as a general term here. We were sent to you, and we could have used our authority as the ones who were sent to you, but we didn't. Um, then, he's, then he really starts, like I say, mixing the metaphors. Uh, he says, instead of using that authority, we were like children among you. So here's Paul the Apostle, who writes such strong letters to people, who demands certain behavior, who calls on them to, to pay attention to the authority he has in Christ. And he says, yeah, but while we were with you, we were with you like little children among you. What does that mean? How would Paul and Silas, Timothy, be like little children with the Thessalonians? Mine doesn't really describe it that way. It brings the mother in. It's the next, it's the, in fact, it's the last part of that verse. Look at the first part of 7. Okay. What does it say starting 7? As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her children. That's the whole verse. That's the whole verse? Okay. okay. My uh, footnote comes up and says some manuscripts were gentle. Some have gentle rather than children. We were gentle among you rather than like children among you. That's the meaning. That's exactly what we're looking at. We didn't come to you with power and strength. We came to you in humility and neediness. Right? Uh, coming out of Philippi, they were in bad shape. Uh, Paul and Silas were recovering from being beaten up. When they get to Thessalonica, they start their ministry, and the people receive them and take care of them. So they're like little children. They need help. And then he immediately turns around and says, we're like a nursing mother who cares for her children. So just, you know, we, we cared for you as you were caring for us. We had needs, you met our needs. Uh, you, know, you had needs, and we met your needs as well. So it's a wonderful relationship that forms there in Thessalonica. Uh, he says, we're those guys who are hardworking, holy, righteous, and blameless. And if you were working with a bunch of 16-year-old girls and said, well, write down what you want in a husband. Well, that's a pretty good list, right? I want somebody that's hardworking, holy, righteous, and blameless. Somebody that I can be proud of. Somebody that my children can be proud of. So I'm like a little child, but I'm also like a nursing mother. I'm a hardworking, holy, righteous, blameless guy. And then he says, I encouraged you like a father encourages his children. So he's the mother and the father and the child all in the same breath. He, he was everything that they needed him to be. You remember in another passage where Paul says, I became all things to all people so that by all means I might win a few. Uh, he just had that ability to find out what the need was 
and to fit in with the way he needed to. Now, you're not going to please everybody. And the people who have the most authority are going to be the least happy when you start pulling followers away from them. The local synagogues in Thessalonica started kicking people out who were naming the name of Jesus. Then they ran Paul and Silas and Timothy out of town, got rid of them, then followed them to Berea to make sure that they didn't get a foothold in Berea. All Paul and Silas and Timothy were doing was giving people good news, talking to them about the gospel. But the people who were losing their influence over the deal got angry and followed them and made life as difficult for them as they possibly could. Uh, then we mentioned last week in chapter 1, in verse 6, he says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord. You welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And we noticed that it was also in chapter 2, you brothers and sisters became imitators of God's churches in Judea. So not only were they imitating Paul and Silas and Timothy in their being persecuted for the word, they're also being imitators of the churches in Judea who had been persecuted as far back as you could imagine. Who was one of the main persecutors of the churches of Judea in the early days? The Apostle Paul. Right? He knows all about the persecution business. There's nothing in these Jewish congregations, there's nothing about this Jewish leadership that surprises Paul. I don't think he's astounded that he gets this kind of opposition because he was part of it. I wonder some of the conversations that we don't get. Let's say Paul is in the marketplace and he's preaching Jesus and one of the leaders of the Jewish synagogue shows up. The kind of conversation that those two might have had. I wonder if Paul ran into fellow students from the school of Gamaliel. Right? You went to the school of Gamaliel. How can you be talking this way about this Jesus guy? I can't believe that you would do this. You're tearing down uh, the law of Moses. You're tearing down the Israeli nation. How could you be like this? Paul had the kind of connections where people knew who he was and when he's teaching about Jesus he's going to get even more of a negative response because they thought he was on their side and now he's preaching the truth uh, and taking people away from the things that they're trying to teach. Which by the way in Jerusalem there was never the, the, the purpose was never to get rid of the Jewish temple or the Jewish congregation or the influence of the Jewish leadership if they would accept Christ. Right? If they had accepted Jesus as Messiah, then the new Christians wouldn't have had anybody to, to fear, nobody to fight with. Uh, the Christians in Jerusalem were still going up to the temple they were still making sacrifices. They were still going to prayer at the temple, doing all those things in the earliest days of the, the church. It was the Jewish leadership that wasn't going to have it. And so they began persecuting, trying to get this new group to stop bothering people, to stop growing. But the church was never designed to just supplant it. If those who believed in Jesus just kept going to synagogue and the synagogue didn't respond negatively to them, there would have been no reason for them not to continue to go to synagogue. But these are people that were raised in the Jewish faith. They're Jewish nationals. Uh, they love the law. There's, there's no reason for them to just completely throw away Judaism. But the Jewish leadership put so much pressure on them that eventually they have to separate themselves from the rest of the Jewish congregation and just be members of the way because they won't allow them to continue in the synagogue to be part of that. Now that goes all the way even back during Jesus' ministry. You remember the guy that was born blind and Jesus and his disciples come in. Jesus spits on the ground and he makes uh, mud out of the spittle and he puts it in the guy's eyes. And he says, go wash your eyes and he comes back seeing and then all of these conversations that take place after that, and the final uh, paragraph or so, the leaders of the synagogue come back, 
and they ask him again. They say, tell us one more time what happened. And he says, I've already told you what happened. Do you want to be his disciples? And they said, you're his disciples. You were born in sin. And that kicked him out of the synagogue. And so, you know, you, if you're not going to do what we want you to do in the way we want you to do it, you can't be part of our synagogue. So there were a lot of Christians who would have just kept being part of the Jewish countryside, the, the, the Jewish collective, they wouldn't let them. So it wasn't necessarily Christians that left the Jewish faith. It was the Jewish faith that, that kicked out the Christians. Look down at verse 17. We get one more. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person but not in thought, uh, out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you so we've had we were like little children we were like nursing mothers we were uh, a hard-working holy righteous blameless bunch we were like a father with his children and we were like orphans when we had to leave so all of those descriptions of how he and uh, Silas and Timothy felt about their relationship with him and then notice in 18 he says we wanted to come see you he said certainly I Paul, again and again, wanted to come see you. But Satan blocked our way. So as far as Paul is concerned, everything that got in his way to get back to the church at Thessalonica was satanic. Uh, Satan was working hard to make sure that Paul couldn't get <coughs> back to that group. Uh, they needed Paul. They, they needed for him to come back and give some more teaching. And we end up with Paul having to do more teaching by way of letters than I think he would have liked to. Uh, it's good for us because if if he's able to go back to Thessalonica, we don't need this letter. If he could have just traveled up there and told them in person the things that he wrote to them, then maybe we don't have this letter. But since he can't get there and he really wants to make sure they're okay, he writes them a letter and answers some of their questions and some of their questions are the same questions that we have. Like when we get over to 4 and 5 and they're asking about what's the end of time going to be like? What's Jesus' second coming going to be like? Uh, those are the passages we preach in funerals. Those are the passages we talk about when we're talking to people, some who believe that there's a rapture, some who don't. And you say, well, what about this passage? And so uh, it's a passage that Paul wrote to them because he couldn't get to them and they needed an answer, if he's able to go, maybe we don't have that passage. So uh, Providence, the Holy Spirit, all involved in these things to uh, give us the information that we need to have. Uh, the persecution has trickled down from Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church itself, but they're still being faithful. They still turn to Paul for help. They still want to know what Paul wants them to do next. So they keep getting back with their apostle, with the one who taught them the truth, and hanging on to it. Uh, the, the last thing he says about this group that's persecuting them, he says they're going to get what they deserve because they are heaping up their sins to the full. Uh, the Old Testament prophets love the analogy of a, a glass of wine. Sometimes it's a glass of blood. And the, the hand of God is stayed until the cup fills up. And so you'll have a question asked, well, God, why aren't you doing something about this nation or this king or these people? Well, the cup of their abomination hasn't filled up yet. And so we're looking at it from a human standpoint, and we're saying, well, this is terrible. How, how could you allow this to go on? And God says, well, I can see all that's going to happen all that has happened. I've got it all under control, and their cup hasn't yet filled up. So Paul uses that illustration to say, this group of people that's messing with you, their cup's full. God's going to take care of it for you.